We, we welcome you today to worship at the Vallejo Drive Church. We trust that as you seek the Lord, you will be blessed by his presence and power in your life. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Let's all stand as we sing together hymn number 90. Behold God, whose power upholds.
O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we invite your presence into our hearts. We thank you for your gracious love for us. We ask that you would fill us with your presence of the Holy Spirit. We pray that our hearts and minds would be drawn to you and that your life will change us by your holy presence. Bless our worship today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome you to the worship service today. If you're a guest with us, looking for a church home, or want any information about our church, uh, just take the little uh, purple uh, slip in the uh, pews and let us know about your interest. 
In the bulletin, there are many announcements that are valuable to you. Take note of them. But uh, this morning, I have a uh, very special opportunity to introduce to you a new member of our pastoral staff. So I'd invite Peter and Melissa to come forward. The conference has assigned a new uh, pastor to us here at Vallejo Drive, Peter Baptiste. Coming up is his wife, Melissa. Uh, Melissa Elsia and son Josiah. And I uh, have another one on the way, a little girl named, uh, oh, what is it? Jasmine. Jasmine. Hasn't arrived yet, but uh, maybe over the course of time we'll be experiencing some additions to our family in a new way. Uh, Peter uh, uh, was born in Trinidad, raised in Canada, educated here in the United States at Oakwood. And uh, he's a very gifted musician, a uh, pianist and organist. In the past, he served as a pastor evangelist in the Caribbean. His ministry has gone all throughout the United States, Canada, and in the Caribbean. He received an, a BA in religion and theology from Oakland, Oakwood. He also has a uh, training in computer software from Andrews University. And uh, he's worked on his master's at La Sierra, lacking one class of finishing, which will be very soon, it will be finished. But uh, you're soon to discover that Peter has been called by the Lord, and uh, the Holy Spirit is working in him, and he will bless you through his ministry today. So Peter, uh, we welcome you to the Vallejo Drive Church family, and please join me in a warm welcome for that. Just want to say thank you to all of you for the warm welcome. It's been my joy and privilege as I've been able to spend some time during the week here uh, with uh, the pastoral staff. And I've had a wonderful time getting to know so many of you. And you've all been so warm and vibrant and friendly and welcoming. And so I just want to say thank you. My wife and I are looking forward to the privilege of being able to serve you here in uh, the area of ministry. I'm told that we are assigned to be the family uh, pastor here. And uh, as you can see, I've got a family with me here today. Amen. Amen. And I'm so happy that uh, we are here and we believe in, in church growth so that our family of three will become a family of, of four very soon. Amen. Amen. And that's that's our first contribution to the growth of this church here at the Vallejo Drive Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today, it's a wonderful day for us because on our first Sabbath, we have an opportunity uh, to dedicate this little guy to the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so I'm privileged that my, my, one of my best friends happens to be here this week. He came for another appointment. His name is Pastor John Scott. He is the uh, youth director of the Ontario Conference of Seventh-day Adventists up in Canada, where I'm originally from. And so at this time, we just want to invite him to come on up, and he's going to lead out in the dedicating of my son. His name is Jesse. Jesse to the Lord. I believe this works. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's a great privilege of mine to be here today and just to witness uh, the installation of one of my good friends, uh, Pastor Peter Batiste, and also a privilege to be here with you all the way from the true north, strong and true Canada. Um, we Canucks, we, we stick together. Um, but it's also a great privilege to fellowship and worship and to also offer this dedication for the life of young Jesse. <clears throat> um, the Bible says, train up a child, and maybe if we can play something very softly as, as we um, have this uh, dedication, that would be very lovely. The Bible says to train up a child in the way that he should go. When he's old enough, he won't depart from it. 
And of course, there are other passages of scripture that speaks to the same thing. Uh, Moses in Deuteronomy chapter six speaks to the fact that we should, in our rising up and in our laying down, in our sitting, in our eating, in the kitchen, wherever we are, we should train up our children. The whole aspect of Christian education or even religious education was uh, second to nothing else in the home of the Hebrew uh, because they believed that the heritage, the rich heritage and the values uh, was passed down through the religious education. First through the mother who spent most of the time with the child and then eventually as the child grew a little older would spend time with the father out in the out in the woods and out in the fields as as they took care of the farming and so on. So the, the passing along of heritage was through the passing along of the values, the values of who God is and what he desires for our will, for his will, sorry, for our lives. Now, the same is true for us today. Um, if the enemy uh, could attack the world, he will do so through our family and he'll begin right there where our children are concerned. And today we won't allow that to happen, amen? Uh, we, today we believe that there's something special that happens after a child is born. We're all celebrating, we have a wonderful experience, we're all smiles and we're all, we're happy about the entire experience. But then the great work, the great work takes place where parents have to pour into their children the values of heaven, the values of love, and of respect and of awe of God, worship and family time and prayer and all the other great values that children must have so that as they increase in life, they will not soon forget those values, but thus those same values will be with them throughout the rest of their lives so that they can be catalysts for change in their community. And that's why today we stop and pause for a few moments to recognize not just the birth of this young child, not just the parents who have given birth to, to him, but also what will happen in this child's life from here on out throughout the rest of his life. And today, I'm inviting each one of you to stand with me and hold someone's hand next to you in solidarity as we pray this prayer of dedication that God through his parents will continue to train him up in the way that he should go so that when he's old enough, Little Jesse will not depart from it. Maybe we can have one of the uh, elders hold him. Yes. You want me to hold? Sure, I'll hold him. And let's pray that he doesn't cry. If he does, then it will be a testament to his preaching skills. All right, well, you can hold him and I'll just uh, pray this prayer. Yes. Shall we, shall we pray? Father, we're so grateful and honored to be in your presence today. We're so thankful that your spirit enjoined us to be here at this house that you have declared to be a house of prayer for all nations. And we have accepted your call and your invitation. And we're here sharing and fellowshipping and worshiping you, who's the creator of all things, of life. Thank you, O oh God, for this great privilege to be here. And thank you also for this opportunity to celebrate you for what you're doing in the life of Pastor Batiste and his family, his wife and his son. We're thankful, O Lord, for the gift of life, and we're thankful for children as well. Thankful, O Lord, that you were with Jesse in his mother's womb from the moment he was conceived until today. And we know that your presence will be with him and rest and abide with him throughout the rest of his life. But today, as we have this dedication, I pray that you will dedicate these parents who have given their time and their resources and their life so that this young boy could be born into this world. I pray that they will be the kind of parents that you'll be proud of. And I pray that each day they will seek first the kingdom of heaven so that all, your, all things and your righteousness will be added unto them. I pray that you will give them strength and energy and sustenance and wisdom and from on high so that as they train this child they will do so faithfully as stewards of this great gift that you have given to them 
We pray this prayer of dedication upon Jesse, Jesse Josiah, two powerful names of scripture. We thank you for his young life, the energy that we see in the, through, the, through his smile and his chattiness and his friendliness. Lord, we know that you have a great and awesome future for him. And I pray, God, that he will look to his parents who have looked to you, and he will trust them as they trust you. And so today we ask for your blessing upon his life from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. May he receive the training that he would need to carry out through his life the values that he will need throughout the rest of his life. I pray that even if part of it might be some chastising, you have reminded us in your word that you do not chasten those you do not love. And so I pray that whatever he's to learn, and may he grow and increase. As Christ, may he do so in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and favor with man. I pray not just a blessing and a dedication upon him, but also upon this great and wonderful church with its pastoral staff and the leaders who are around. I pray that as they open their doors to this family and to little Jesse, that the worship services that they provide the class, classroom environment that they, that, they, that they give, and the lessons from your word that they offer, all will conspire to his great training as a young child according to Christ. And so today we thank you for your dedication upon this family, upon Jesse, and upon this church. May your name ultimately be praised and glorified and honored. For we, your people declare it to be so in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Related deacons to come forward to collect the day's offering. Today's offering is for church budget. And I would like you to refer to the sheet, to the back of the information sheet that you received, the bulletin. And it says church finance. And our expense year to date is $422,000. And if we subtract what we have received so far, we get that we are a deficit of $154,000. So we are in a hole, we are, we are borrowing from ourselves. So what we need to do is bridge the gap. Now how do we bridge the gap? We could do several things, we could turn off the lights. We could turn off the air condition. We could not have music because we need e electricity for the organ to play and you know, for us to see what's on the thing. You know, I, I, I came from a place that had a hurricane and worship in churches where they didn't have electricity. So maybe. The other alternative is for us as members to bridge the gap. Deacons will wait on us for tithes and offering.
us pray. Father God, we know that you will bless this offering and you will allow it to bridge the gap between what we have and the deficit. Continue to bless this church, we ask in Jesus' name. At this time, uh, will the children come down for the children's story and will the congregation remain standing and greet each other Good morning, everyone. I was getting a little nervous. I was thinking, I don't see my friends. And then I saw Elijah, and I saw Caleb, and going, oh, phew. And then you came down, and I saw so many more of you giving me hugs, and thank you. So good to have you all here this morning, this Sabbath morning. And I have a special little story to tell you. And I have a question for you, too. So I'll ask you to answer that question. Have you ever said the words, this is the best day ever? Good, I've heard it. I've heard some of you may have said that. Just yesterday, one of my students said, while well, eating a donut, this is the best day ever. Have you ever been on a field trip and said, this is the best day ever? Yeah, raise your hands. I've heard that many times. How about, Anybody else have another example that they want to share uh, when you said the words or when you remembered saying, this is the best day ever? Okay, Caleb. When it was walk to school day and then I would get a cinnamon roll, but I didn't get it, and then going to Koinonia Kids. Going to, a, oh, going to where? Koinonia Kids. Oh, okay. Oh, that's on Wednesday nights when you do that. Oh, so it was the best day ever for that. Awesome going to Disneyland. I have heard that before. I've, I've said that too, going to Disneyland. Okay, one more. I'm on the first day of school. Oh, good for you. First day of school is the best day. Oh, I know you really want to share. Okay, this is the last one. Okay, last one. Um, yesterday, my second cousin came. It was the best day ever. It was so exciting. She's staying one more day. That is very exciting. I love those. I know, Damon, I'm sorry, but we just don't have any more time because you have to still go to Children's Church, too, and that's coming up. Have you ever thought of saying, or have you ever, have you ever thought to yourself, this is the best day ever when you help someone else? Oh, thinking about that, because all the times when you said, this is the best day ever, was when great things were happening to you, right? Well, I want to share a quick little story. I'm going to try to make it really short. Something that happened uh, a few months ago. It actually happened in the month of March. I was walking with my husband with my dog, Cooper. And some of you have heard me talk about Cooper in the mountains where I live. And while we were walking in the, in the fire trail, we saw this man. I had never seen him in my neighborhood before. He was not wearing any shoes. He had shorts on. His clothes were torn. His skin had scratches all over him. And he walked kind of funny. And he didn't look well at all. And he was young. He wasn't that old. 
And my dog Cooper went up to him and tried to make him pet him. And usually when my dog goes to somebody and they like dogs, they pet him. He didn't even acknowledge him at all. And Cooper's like, what's going on? This, people usually like me to, he likes getting pets from people, but this, this man didn't. So I was really worried for him. And I didn't have a phone and I didn't have any water. And my husband stayed with him and tried to talk with me because after he, st he stopped and I went to go find somebody in the neighborhood with a phone and we called 911. But the dispatcher said, we'll send somebody when we have time. He, and I said, but he's hurt. I know something's not right. My husband tried to talk to him, but he didn't talk back. He didn't say anything. And I tried to say something, he didn't say anything. And then a, somebody who was walking by gave him a bottle of water, but he didn't drink it. We had some friends that lived nearby in the neighborhood. They gave us some food. We brought it to him. He didn't touch it. And he decided, we, we're going to go home and get some clothes for him because it was getting cold. It was almost dark. So we quickly went home and we got, and I'm looking for the police to come. And he, they never showed up. But we've got our clothes. And we went up there in our car, and there were police cars everywhere. And we were so glad. Oh, thank you, Lord. Because I was praying, too. And when we got there, the police were talking to him. And we didn't think he could talk. But he was talking. And he looked awake before he was just kind of somewhere else. I was really worried about him. Turns out, the food that we gave him, he ate a banana. And that banana really helped him. And he drank some water. And he said, thank you to us. And he said, God bless you for bringing him some food. We put a sweatshirt on him. And we got him some shoes to wear. And then the police said, thank you for calling. And I felt so happy that I was able to, that we were able to help this young man and they took him away and they took him to the hospital because he wasn't well. He was really sick. He was really, really skinny too. And the police even said, they said thank you to us and that felt so good and he said thank you. And it almost felt like it was the best day ever that day. That day turned out to be one of the best days ever for us because we helped others and helped him. Just. I just may know that he was getting the help he needed because I was so worried for him. So my challenge to all of you is to think about who your neighbor is. Because in the Bible, Jesus said the first in March, in March, and I'm sorry, in Matthew 22, 33, to love the Lord with all your heart. And the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor with all your heart as you love yourselves. So your neighbor could be the person you're sitting next to. Your neighbor could be a family member that might need your extra help. Your neighbor might be a stranger like that man was to us. Your neighbor could be someone who's not nice to you at school. That could be your neighbor. But by helping others, it, it might be the best day ever for them and more so for you. Thank you for sitting so quietly, most of you. <laughs> and I welcome all of you to go to Children's Church if you're five years old and older. You may walk quietly. Thank you.
Well, good morning, church. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I really, really look forward to that time where we get to pray together as a church family. So I invite you now, if you want to receive a very special blessing this morning, please feel free to come down uh, just uh, at, the, at the base of the platform here um, as we sing our, our prayer song. Otherwise, uh, kneel as we approach God in prayer. Uh, our prayer song is number uh, 671. At this time, as I say, please do come, come, come forward, come forward, and we can pray together in front of him. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you and we bless your holy name. This morning we pause to meditate on your mighty and wondrous works. You have created us and you continue to sustain us, offering us the free gift of your grace that we might have a meaningful and everlasting relationship with you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for this church, for my sisters and brothers here today who are gathered together to worship you and to make their requests known to you. May you continue to stretch out your providential hand in all of our lives. Father, you know that we're all broken, all of us, in, in different various ways. Some of us sick, some of us poor, some of us addicted to a sin that we just don't seem to be able to get rid of in our lives. Some of us struggle with forgiving others. Some of us struggle to forgive ourselves for past failures. So we feel embarrassed, we feel guilty, we feel ashamed even to dare to approach you in prayer. Yet, despite all that, you have promised us that we are justified by the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Today, may we accept that love and extend that love to our neighbors and to our enemies alike. Father, help us embrace our transformation that Jesus has worked out and help us to experience the radical change of character that the Holy Spirit makes possible, possible for all of us. Guide this church. Lord, I pray that you would grow this church. May our vision always be your vision. This morning we think especially of the recent tragedy in Las Vegas the 58 lives that were taken without reason, without any sense at all. And we pray also for the countless family members who have just been robbed of their loved ones for no reason at all. Lord, please, we urge you, give them some peace and some comfort during this horrific, terrible time. Our prayers go out to all of those people. May we commit to working alongside you in the redemption of our world by doing all that we can to overcome violence and overcome hatred with forgiveness, self-sacrifice, and love. Lord, we want nothing more than to be your willing participants as you build your kingdom here on this earth. So we bring these praises and we bring these petitions to you, asking you both for the big things and for the small things in life. And so we end our prayer like Jesus ended his in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying that we hand our own will over to you and ask for your will to be the force that drives our lives. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to once again introduce uh, Peter as our speaker this morning, as well as our new pastor. Uh, he was also a, a student of mine last quarter, and so I always have to remind him of that. Uh, we will have a, a good relationship, and I say without exaggeration that he's definitely uh, one of the best students that, that I've had there at La Sierra. Um, and so I have to steal a little bit of his thunder this morning just to clarify and remind everyone that Peter is not our senior pastor. That may not have been communicated clearly because we are still looking for a senior pastor. Uh, in the meantime, Peter is here uh, to help us, to help with family ministries and Sabbath schools. And so we look forward to, to Peter's ministry here at the church. So God bless you, Peter, in your ministry. The scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 58. This is what Peter will be preaching from this morning. The Bible says, Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you've not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. Amen. Just want to thank uh, Pastor Shane for reading that scripture and for introducing me. Uh, indeed, I was a student of his, and um, I declare it was one of the best classes I ever took. I learned so much, uh, Pastor Shane, in his class that um, I think my entire preaching has been enhanced dramatically. If any of you ever have a chance to take a class from from Pastor Shane, I encourage you to do so. He's indeed a man of rich knowledge. And I have something in common with, with all the pastors here because uh, Pastor Shane was my professor at La Sierra and then Pastor Luke, well, you know, his first name is my middle name, amen? And so Pastor Luke and I are connected through our naming. And then of course, Pastor Mark, well, you know, the Bible says in Psalm 37, 37, Mark the perfect man. <laughs> Amen. Mark the perfect man. And so I'm just so happy to be able to be with you here today and to share God's word uh, on this great morning. I'm going to put this down here. I want to just share with you briefly on the subject I've entitled Getting God's Attention. Getting God's Attention. Why don't you just turn to your neighbor and tell him you got to get God's attention. Get, getting God's Attention. Pray with me, gracious God, speak now 
In the stillness while we wait on you, hushed our hearts to answer in expectancy. And in this quiet little moment, be to us a word that's power. Amen. How do people of faith get God's attention? In a world racked with war, torn by terror, and hemorrhaging with suffering, while millions grope for answers in a dark, cold, and creepy world, in times like these, Christians seek connection and refuge in God. And in that two-way contact, God hears us and we hear God. But when that connection breaks, both God and God's people struggle to get each other's attention. And after three raging storms, five unsettling earthquakes, the worst mass shooting in modern U.S. history, and a looming conflict with North Korea, most people of faith today just wonder, uh, how do I get the assurance of God's abiding presence? And just like these biblical post-exilic people, we may ask, how do I get God's comfort, God's protection, and God's attention? But for these ancient people of faith seeking connection with a seemingly inattentive God, God says to the prophet, never mind getting my attention, you get their attention. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and tell my people their sins. God instructs the people, the prophet, to go against all accepted norms, violate their vaulted values of decency, and cry aloud breach their personal privacy and tell their business publicly. Suspend their subtle sensibilities and don't hold back. Get the attention of these so-called good, temple-going, animal-sacrificing, commandment-keeping, Sabbath-observing, praying, fasting, post-exilic people of God and tell them about their sins. God says, speak this message to so-called good people, not the pagan worshipers of Baal and Nebo and Molech or Ashtoreth or those deaf, dumb, and dead gods can't see, hear, or speak. We know already, we know this already because prophet Elijah taunted those same pagan worshipers. They begged and pleaded and sang and danced and prayed to their gods. They tried everything they could, but Baal didn't hear and Nebo didn't answer and Molech didn't help and Ashtoreth didn't move. But now the house of Israel faces a similar crisis because they no longer hear from the true and living God. They worship, they fast, and they pray, but they feel like somehow they just can't get God's attention. They felt God had become blind, deaf, and dumb like those pagan gods. So now the true and living God says, I want you to tell this house of Jacob about their sins. Prophesy after the exile to interpret past and present judgment. Tell this message to a released and restored people who want to be good but just don't know how. The reader can find messages of future judgment for other nations in previous chapters, but in Isaiah 58, 1 to 10, the prophet speaks to a people God had already judged in the Babylonian captivity, the house of Jacob. They now tried harder to do better and be more faithful. They called themselves the people of God. But while they worshipped, prayed, and fasted, they agonized. And while they studied God's word and God's way, they cried. You could hear them complaining and asking, why can't we get God's attention? Why does God not hear? Why won't God help us with our lives and protect us and comfort us? I hear them say, why should should I pray any longer? Why should I fast anymore? God, you don't even notice and you don't even hear. What do you do when you feel like you can't get God's attention? What do you do when it seems like God does not hear your cry? 
How do you handle dark despair, cold cheerlessness, and creepy circumstances all alone without the assurance of God's presence? And how do you help others struggling with this same predicament? Here God addresses their concern with this prophetic plain talk. You fast and worship to look good while making profit. But during your fast, you hit the poor with your fist. You win in life and get on top, but all others get to sink to the bottom and lose. You're only fasting to pretend like you're on my side, but deep down, you're just looking out for yourself. Oh, what a sham you pull and what a lie you tell. Who do you think you're fooling? The God of heaven? I see through your lies and I hear your false piety. How dare you call it prayer when you don't live to be the hands and feet of the God who answers prayer? How dare you call your fast real when what you do in your daily life is so unreal and fraudulent? How dare you say you love God when you don't love the ones God loves? How dare you claim... Uh, faithfulness to God when you think you could fool the God of the faithful but then the focus shifts from these false worshipers complaining about God to the very God they're complaining to God asks the question in verse 5 do you think this is the kind of fast I'm looking for? Do I want you to show off your humility? Do I want mere mechanical, meaningless ritual? Do I want outward sorrow but no heartfelt remorse? That may be the kind of fast the pagan gods accept. The pagans believed their gods took the side of the rich, you know, and they aligned with the rich but neglected the poor, the widows, and the strangers. But our God is different. Riches don't get God's attention. In Psalm 68 verse 5, God claims to be a father to the fatherless and a defender of the widow. That's the poor. Proverbs 19 17 said, whoever helps the poor lends to God. And in Isaiah 58, we hear God saying, I ain't hearing you unless you get your heart Get rid of exploitation in the marketplace. Free the oppressed. Cancel their debts. Instead of your fasting, take your bread and go eat with the hungry. Instead of afflicting your souls in sadness, invite the homeless, sad, and afflicted into your homes. Instead of putting on sackcloth and ashes, go clothe the naked. Do this. Then the light of God's glory will shine through you. Then your prayers will go up and God will say, Here. God's judgment on the house of Jacob. These restored post-exilic people of God could not do this. And the record of this instruction to preach this prophetic sermon to a released people forms the evidence that captivity, adversity, and hardship cannot change the heart. It may alter your resolve, but it won't make you live right. Their ego and pride won't let them see that everything they had was a gift from God. Their wealth, their strength, their wisdom to get money, all of it came from God. In Isaiah 29, 13, God cites the problem. This people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me by delivering this message to an exiled people. God demonstrates that even repentant, God-fearing people cannot produce all that God wants from them, no matter how much they try. That's why, though they tried, they couldn't get God's attention. Have you ever felt this frustration? You try, but God looks away from you. You work hard, but God never even winks at you. You do your best, but God does not smile at you. Have you ever asked these questions here at the Vallejo Drive Seventh-day Adventist Church? How do I get God's attention? What causes God to stir on the throne and look my way? If you have, then in some way this passage tells your story. But here's the bad news. These people have a heart problem. Only hearts aligned with God's heart can get 
get God's attention. Fasting and praying don't get God's attention unless the heart is right. But wait, there's even more bad news. No man or woman, boy or girl, can align their heart with God's heart. God and God alone must fix the human heart. And for God to get what God wants from God's people, then God must do something more for God's people. We ought not get up in here today and look down at these folks in the text because we can't do what God wants either without God. Unless God changes our hearts, we will never be aligned with God. And in Ezekiel 36, 26, God speaks to these same exiled people and promises to give them a new heart and a new spirit. God says, I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And in the gospel story, God gets our attention through the great love displayed on the cross. And in the gospel story, God expresses that his love for humanity is so profound that he's willing to change every human heart and every human life. Paul declares in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. In Christ Jesus, God not only fulfills the promise of Ezekiel 36, 26, to bring and give us a new heart, but he also satisfies the demands of Isaiah 58. In Luke 4, 18, Christ himself answers the demands of our passage. Christ Jesus proclaims that he came to preach the gospel to the poor and heal the brokenhearted and preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In his work and life, Jesus fulfilled the perfect righteous fast and prayer and work and justice God demands. Oh, hallelujah, for the Lamb of God this morning. He fasted and he got God's attention. He prayed and got God's attention. He fed the hungry and he is the bread of life for every hungry soul. He not only did righteousness, but he himself is righteousness and he clothes all of us with his robe of righteousness. On the cross, God crucified the entirety of the human family. He crucified all our human pride and our evil. The cross cast the selfishness and the pride and the glory of man in the dust so that now with hearts that are new and aligned with the heart of God, we can be God's eyes and God's hands and God's feet in this world. We can make a real difference in a dark and cold and creepy world because the perfect antidote to dark, cold, and creepy is light, warm, and fuzzy. Cozy. Light, warm, and cozy, you know. And what gives us joy this morning is that after the cross, God turns your light on. Verse 8 says, Then shall your light break free like the morning. The Message Bible puts it this way. Do this, and the lights will turn on in your life. Whenever I call in the name of Jesus, I get God's attention. God hears and answers and says, Here am I. When I need God most, God's presence draws near and God turns my lights on. How do I know? I know because that's my testimony. I'm all wrapped up and tied up in God's program, you see. I testify I used to be fixated on my own agenda uh, at one time, but God changed my heart and turned my lights on. I know my story is your story, so go on and say amen if you feel like it. I do declare I'm not what I used to be because Jesus changed me and made me his child. And now I get God's attention anytime I need it. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. I do declare I'm now one of his sons. And yes, I know I'm a child of God, just like all of you here this morning. How do I know I'm a child of God? I know because he pays the child support. That's right, he takes care of me, hallelujah. How do I know? I know because he changed my name. He changed me completely. He says, a new name will I give you. How do I know? I know because he always stops to pick me up when I fall. How do I know? I know because like verse 8 of this passage says, he turned this little light of mine on, and now he always sends me on soul-saving missions to shine the light of God's love for others who are lost in darkness and looking to hear his 
his voice. You see, while I've been trying to get God's attention, God's been trying to get mine. But God's goal was not so much to get my attention. God just wanted to turn my light on and let my light shine. And that's my testimony. That's all I came to say today, that I must be a child of God. I know I'm a child of God. Now, oh, I got to quit now, but I'll never forget it one day as I flew from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, over to London, England to preach for some evangelistic meetings. I was so tired, I boarded that plane with every intention of getting some sleep, but God said, sleep nothing, let your little light shine. And I got seated next to a young man who just couldn't stop talking. Some of you know the type I'm talking about. He proceeded to tell me all about his life story, and all I could do was just sit there and say, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, I see, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'll never forget it. He told me, he said, you know, I work with my dad. He said, we run a company called Dawn and Sons, Dawn and Sons. And our head office is in New Jersey. And he said, we service all the lights for all the runways in North America. And every now and then, when there's an emergency, his father calls him and sends him out to represent the company and fix the specialized lighting system of all the runways and all the airports. And then he leaned closer to me and he said, and, and what is it that you do, mister? <laughs> oh, I knew I had him. Without missing a beat, I said, well, I work with my daddy, too. We run a company called God and Sons. God and, God and Sons? I say, yeah, God and Sons. We supply and service the lights for all the planets. And every now and then, my daddy sends me out on a, on a mission critical emergency errand journey to rescue folks caught in darkness. Oh, but all of you here at the Vallejo Drive Seventh day Adventist Church form vital parts of this great company, God and sons and daughters. Amen, somebody. Amen. We're all children of God. We're lit with the flame of God's love. No storm can stop us. No earthquake can destroy us. No gunman can vanquish our light. No war can end our message of life and hope and love and joy and peace. Thus, God called us here, right here, to shine a light that illuminates all the darkness right here in this community. If you get on God's program, God's eyes rest upon you. You'll have God's comfort, God's protection, and yes, God's attention. As I begin my ministry here at this great community of faith, I know somebody here today wants God to change your heart, give you a new heart, and turn your light on. If that's your desire, I just invite you to stand with me, with me right where you are. I want to pray for you right now. Just will you stand with me real quick right now? Gracious God, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, O oh God, for the power of the gospel that shines with a luminous and glory in our lives, bringing transformation for our darkness and a light that not only lights up our life, but is bright enough to light this entire community. We thank you for this great community of faith, for every member. Bless us here right now. May your spirit abide. For all of us who desire your power, your grace, your goodness, and your glory in our lives to be that shining light. Bless us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Remain standing with me as we sing that, that great song we learned so many years ago, 580, This Little Light of Mine, This Little Light of Mine. <laughs>
and shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace in thy rising up and in your setting down, in your going out and in your coming in, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your sorrow, until you come to the place where there's no more sunset and no dawning. 